universe is a clock, wound since the beginning of time, of everything. Each spiral, each galaxy, each star and planet whirls and spins its eternal revolutions, held in place by forces straining in constant competition, balanced one against the other, slowly, slowly running down. Some philosophers have seen the image of a clock as the nearest we can come to a metaphor for perfect creation, absolute craft. Each tick immaculately geared to the next, each talk the answering equivalent. Behind the face, behind the hands, is a universe in miniature the cosmos in a casing. Balances, bridges, escapements and stems, turning and springing, releasing and rolling. This is the language of time. Not the time, time. Once upon a time, there was a man who held the universe in his top pocket. A universe encased in solid gold and crafted entirely by his own two hands. Big, plate-like hands. Hands that were engineered to rebore the engine of his beloved Bentley rather than crafting beautiful, intricate timepieces. Yet this passionate, dedicated man had the vision that was to make him master of his trade. He became known as the world's greatest living watchmaker. If I could save time in a bottle The first thing that I'd like to do I think that uh, it is worth noting is that I'm now very ancient unable to remember everything I hear. I can go back to my first birthday. Really? <laughs> For George Daniels, almost any universe would have been more welcome than the one he was born into. A childhood of Dickensian neglect and poverty. In a crowded, unruly, unpredictable world, he became tough, inventive, sharp and strong. And then, inexplicably, an object of great importance appears in his life. Something quite magical. Something that should not have been a part of the world that he inhabited. A pocket watch. It is ordered, self-contained, self-controlled, self-regulating and utterly beguiling. And for the incredible journey this watch will take him on, it might as well have been dropped at his feet by a fabled white rabbit, racing onwards to another, curiouser world. But it didn't work. For all its beautiful complexity, it lacked the movement that made sense of its engineering. So, he turned to the only other timepiece available. Now, when he takes apart the family alarm clock, it's a dangerous thing to do because his parents use that alarm clock. If they come home and see him doing that, he is bound to get a ferocious beating. But he doesn't care. He's so driven by this intense curiosity to see what is inside that clock. It reflected his own view of life. It was independent. 
it functioned without any outside interference or outside help. Watches and clocks just stood there, ticking away. There's nothing more attractive than a good watch. It's historic, intellectual, technical, aesthetic, amusing, useful. You couldn't beat it. Covers every field and supplies a living for hard up watchmakers like me. When I was uh, 10 years of age, I knew all the famous makers of watches and clocks. And it makes life so much more interesting, you know, about these things. I knew which were the important ones. Um, John Arnold, very, very important, I knew that. And I also knew that I couldn't exceed the best qualities of his work. But from him, I could see which way I had to go. Anybody who went in the other way wasn't going to succeed. I mean, it's just sheer egocentricity. But nevertheless, that's the way it gets done. One of George's greatest achievements was his invention of the coaxial escapement. The first new horological development in 250 years and widely accepted as the most important of the 20th century. It took years of focused, intense effort to get from that first broken pocket watch to master watchmaker. But his survivor's instinct and his obsession with the mechanical combined and from unforgiving materials, he crafted his life. As a boy, I, I didn't really understand the purpose of school. My parents were very keen that I did very well at school, but I didn't really understand why. And likewise, going through school, I ver had very little awareness of what went on outside of school life. And I mean, I, I know that at school I was always very practical. I always made models, balsa wood models, which I enjoyed making and always trying to perfect. But it really wasn't until my father suggested that I go on the horology course in Manchester. We talked about um, restoring antique furniture and he was very keen on that. So we applied to the school in Manchester, but unfortunately, as our application went in, they decided to cancel a course forever, you know, so had to think again. And in the evening Manchester Evening News, I saw this um, article about the School of Horology in Manchester. And I was quite interested in that myself. So it seemed very, very good. And I came back, you know, and I mentioned it to him. And he said, yes, it would be interesting to do that. He, he was full of enthusiasm. My first day at college was really my best day of education ever. It was fantastic. Really, my life started at that point. That was a real awakening, I suppose. And from that moment onwards, I knew that this is going to be my life, watches or clocks. I didn't know what at that point, but I knew it was going to be one of those two. After he'd only been at this horology school for about a week and he's full of enthusiasm, he skeletonised his pocket watch, which I thought was, you know, it's pretty keen. He did it all in his spare time. And one evening he wanted to have a look at a clock. And he found one of ours and he sort of took it to pieces, took the plates apart, all the wheels dropped out. About eight, you know, eight wheels with pinions on each end fitting between the plates. I said, that's very good. What are you going to do now, Roger? Yeah, I don't know. He said, well, I say I should put it together, knowing that he wouldn't be able to do this. He picked up one plate, left hand, and just picked these wheels up, 
that one goes there, that one goes there, that one goes there. All eight wheels went in and then you just shut it. Every wheel just got into the right pinion hole. And so it seemed the restless young schoolboy who was so unsure of his future had stumbled upon his destiny. All great watchmakers are historians. All great watchmakers know what came before them, and they tease out of that knowledge a way forward for themselves. It starts with the sun. The great sky clock was the first regulator, marking the time when men could hunt, fish, plant, or harvest. It's time in the heavens determined by the seasons. But as soon as the regularity of these phases was noted, they were measured. And as soon as measured, put to use. As every nation developed, newer technologies were needed. In navigation, clocks became symbolic of mankind's ability to conquer the natural world. In England, ships were being lost at sea well, even around the world, were being lost at sea. A man called John Harrison, a very famous English watchmaker, he managed to create the very first accurate timekeepers, which enabled navigators to locate their position at sea. But as uh, societies advanced, as things improved, with, from the ships in the 1600s and, and through to Industrial Revolution, when the railways came, then obviously to have a time base was important uh, across the meridian and, and in time zones. So as everybody knew, you know, the time was the same. As industrialization took hold, the mechanization of human life took over and time became the possession of the factory owner. Lengths of days were irrelevant. It was hours worked that mattered. And suddenly your common man, he needed to make sure he was at work on time. And that's where mass production started. And so for the common man, they became commonplace. Whatever symbolic influence they could claim was reduced still further with digital devices that could tell the time within millionths of a second using a bit of quartz and a battery. The mechanical timepiece was made redundant. From looking at the sky to gauge our place in the day, we can see the time anywhere. We are pursued by beeps and digits, mobiles and tablets, PCs and computers, all of them. Remote devices clicking precisely, showing the numbers that equate to the time. And yet... The position of the hands on the face is a far more instinctive statement of the time. They represent the cyclical nature of it all, from the turning sun to all its suns, the days, the weeks, the seasons, our lives and deaths. Time ticks in our veins. But the success of the digital revolution was overwhelming. It takes a particular kind of cussedness to change the way mankind is moving. After seeing the world of mechanical watches brought close to dissolution, George Daniels decided that the world was wrong. And almost single-handedly, he revived the craft of creating handmade timepieces. It was made quite easy for me, really. All I had to do was uh, remember what all the makers in the past had done. He started repairing, restoring, um, became an agent for Breguet in London and actually made um, Breguet clocks. He made uh, two, three wheel clocks, very, very sought after. And Abram Louis Breguet was a very, very famous French watchmaker. And I suppose he saw the quality of Breguet's work and he thought he could improve on it, which quite clearly he did with the double wheel escapement and the coaxial escapement. <laughs> A timepiece has its own ticking heart, the escapement, 
a life-giving mechanism of balance wheels and levers that transfer energy to the time-keeping elements of the machine. They bring it to life. Many great watchmakers have tried to perfect this device, not only to make this heart stronger and more stable, but to make clocks and watches more and more accurate. For 250 years, it was Mudge's lever escapement that reigned supreme. That is, until George Daniels decided he could do better. You're hard at work, I see. Well, yes. Have you tell me how you go about all this? Well, it depends on uh, a variety of circumstances. Of course, first, uh, one needs to have the incentive to make a watch. And uh, usually one thinks of uh, a new idea or an innovation that um, uh, might help uh, affect an improvement in rate. Those are ruby jewels, are ruby they? Ruby jewels, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I make those on this little machine over here, cut them to my own shapes. Uh, this tooth is locked on the locking stone. The balance will turn to the right, carry the lever with it, unlock this wheel, which will fall onto that stone, while the tooth here will fall onto that impulse pallet. So it's a fairly um, fast-moving, complex action. But I think it'll add charm to the watch when it's completed. Totally unique, George. <laughs> Well, it is unique, and one only hopes that it's um, pretty beneficial in the end. You see, here are the basic components. George realised that there's a fundamental flaw with the lever escapement, which is used in see, all uh, mechanical watch watches today. today. And the main problem with the lever escapement is that it requires lubrication in order for it to function correctly. Um, you do figure all the angles in detail. Well, that's vitally important. Say, because mm -hmm. precision timekeeping only comes from meticulously observing certain functions of the escape one. If you don't do that, uh, the watch won't give up its best performance. Now, the problem with all lubrication is that after time, it, its condition will deteriorate. Eventually, the tooth will find it harder to push through the thickening oil. And because it's now harder to push through, it'll affect the rate of timekeeping of the watch. So George saw this as being the major problem with the lever escapement. And what he set about doing was trying to redesign an escapement to avoid this sliding action. The difference between this and the um, conventional escapement occurs because there is now no rubbing action between the escape wheel, the impulsing wheel, and the oscillator. There is simply a gentle push as this tooth falls onto that pallet and gently pushes it aside. It's just like pushing open a gate. No friction involved at all. Whereas in the conventional escape, when there's a huge sliding action as the wheel passes the locking pallets. George spent a lot of time um, reviving uh, the mechanical watch industry. And then now, the majority of the Omega watches throughout the world have got George's coaxial escapement. Well, I was fortunate enough to meet him in the 1960s when I first started my career the firm called Camera Cuss & Company. I met George when he used to come in and talk to old Mr Cuss about watches and all sorts of things. And so I was thrilled when I eventually joined Sotheby's in the uh, late 1970s to find George was the consultant and we were able to start up our relationship again. He would uh, regularly come in and uh, have a chat about his clocks and his watches and his cars as well. He'd often bring a watch that he'd just made to show us. It was <laughs> thrilling. We all thought, oh, what have you got, George? What's in that pocket, you know? It's the fact that he's the first person for so long to have produced everything, every part of the watch. I think, I believe, apart from the springs, yes. but everything else, the dials, the cases, the movements, and nobody else has done that. No, it's quite remarkable, especially as they were such complicated watches. It's quite easy to make an elegant watch. 
Is that for these young men today? This anxious to show their mastery of the machine. They forget what they're doing it for. And uh, I believe that to be the most important aspect of a rollage is to get the aesthetic right. And that's how we selling the watch once you've got the aesthetic right. I think the ferociousness that George applied to work comes from his childhood. It was a way he escaped the violence, he escaped hunger, he escaped abuse. He just disappeared into work. It's a lonely job, you know, if you looked at Riversdale and when George lived in Riversdale all by himself, cooked his meal in the evening, watched his television, um, had lots of visitors and the house was always alive in that respect. But when he was in the workshop, no. Dedicated, sit in the workshop by yourself, you know, fan heater on um, and work. And that's how he did it. I never made a watch for commercial reasons. Always they were handmade for specific reasons which would, if properly exploited, improve the performance of the watch. Indeed, the very uh, word uh, horology means timekeeping. And that was my business, to uh, make the watch a better watch for good and all. George has been heralded as a genius, a pioneer with a visionary spirit. The recipient of countless medals and awards from his peers, Daniels now ranks among the horological greats that he himself was once in awe of. He single-handedly influenced the entire horological industry and will go down in history as one of the greatest watchmakers of all time. Well, I first met George when I was at the college in Manchester and I was studying to be a watch and clock repairer. And at that point, I didn't think it was possible for one person to make a watch. <laughs> It requires concentration. Anyway, George came along and he brought out this wonderful pocket watch, this space traveller. And on looking at this piece, you know, I just thought what an incredible achievement. How on earth is it possible? Actually, my father, he bought me for that Christmas, he bought me a copy of George's book, Watchmaking. And in it, it tells you how to make a pocket watch from start to finish. I spent something like 12 to 16 hours every day in the workshop with new ideas and experiments. And, because quite a lot of work goes into experimenting with an obscure subject like horology. But we got through it all and, uh, and made a contribution. And the books I wrote are now accepted as definitive manuscripts and uh, I think they'll go on forever now. There's nothing else to write about them. On reading the book from cover to cover several times, I finally realised, I mean, the book is written so well and it's so easy to understand, but I thought, well, if George could make a watch, then surely I could make a watch. Approached George and asked if he would apprentice me. Anyway, he invited me over to the island, told me that he wouldn't, but nevertheless encouraged me and said, well, if you want to make watches, go away and start uh, working on your own. He said it, nobody taught him to do it, so, you know, it is possible. Upon completing college, Roger went to work at Tag Heuer, and likewise, a year later, I went and joined him there. After working full-time, probably for 18 months, he, he went to the company and sort of asked to reduce his hours to two or three days a week to concentrate on the completion of his first pocket watch. Unfortunately, you know, they declined his offer, so he literally left 
and he found trade work to fill the gaps and earn the money. And he completed that first pocket watch when he was 22, which was a tourbillon, and that really is, is unheard of. Roger is very precise. He's got endless patience, sort of an abnormal degree of patience. When he was at home and he qualified, he was working for this um, watch repair business in Bolton. In his spare time, he was making a watch, this one he was hoping to take along to see George Daniels. And just earning enough, basically, to give my parents a bit of rent and pay a loan off for equipment. You know, I didn't have any spare money, basically. It was a very basic lifestyle. But I needed to because I was working 12, 14 hours a day, six days a week. Sets up in his parents' garage, works at making a watch like three or four days a week, and the other days of the week, he works at repairs so he can earn some money. Now this is remarkably like what George did. The first watch I started making in my father's garage and I chopped a bit out of it and made a little room, only about 10 foot by, sort of six, seven foot. I never made components for a watch before, but nevertheless, I had, uh, I had George's book, Watchmaking, to help me. He'd spend all day making a tiny little part, and then he'd come in the evening and say, I lost it. I'd say, what do you mean you lost it? It's on the floor somewhere, I can't find it. I mean, most people just go out of their minds, but what are you going to do? He said, I have to make it again. And sometimes that happened, maybe, I'm not exaggerating, two or three times. Three days, totally wasted work. Just took it on, on the chin, so to speak. I mean, it's very difficult because I didn't know how to treat the materials that I had to work on. Also, I was learning 32 individual trades, which no watchmaker other than George Daniels and one or two others have ever learned, ever achieved. But nevertheless, the watch did come together. I think the whole process took about 18 months. And it's a surprise when the watch ticked. And it really only did just tick. Two years later, he goes back to George after having spent 3,500 hours making a watch. It only just worked, really. It was a bit hit and miss. And I was nervous that it may stop while it was in George's hands. But uh, anyway, he had a look at it, but he wasn't happy. You could just tell. I mean, I was hoping that his face would light up and say, well done. But well, he was honest. I meet lots of young men who are inspired to propose that they're going to start a new form of horology which will eliminate all the old fashioned bad ways and they are a new system and they produce. I've got pictures of watches here that you can't tell the time by. You can't see the hands on some of them. He, he was a bit annoyed, really, that I'd gone over there and uh, wasted his time showing him this watch, which was um, no good. Now, the thing worked. It told the time. You would think that would be enough. Not for George. Telling the time was never enough for George. George looked at it and said, go away and finish it properly. It's all about finish. It looked handmade and not created. George always believed you should never see the hand of the maker in any mechanical object. The mark of the maker has to be completely washed away. The elegance is supreme, you know, it's got to be elegant. People won't buy if it's not elegant, and if people are not buying, you're not being a success. He um, sent me away with a bit of a flea in my ear and um, told me to make another watch. Being told that you can't do something, then I immediately want to go out and prove that I can do it. I just wasn't prepared to let it go. Making the first watch took a year and a half, but the second watch I thought, well, I've been going to spend so much time learning and perfecting how to make it and how to make it more complicated. And so I added a, a four year perpetual calendar mechanism onto it. So it adjusts for every single month and then it self-corrects for the long and shorts and then also it corrects for your leap year. So it's a very complicated piece. But I felt that that extra complication would give me the 
opportunity to practice and improve the skills that I was so obviously lacking, really. Roger was willing to gamble with the most important thing in life, time. He was willing to gamble that he could make a great watch. That is an enormous gamble, particularly when you're in your early 20s and you're making tourbillons and perpetual calendars. The life of a master watchmaker is a lonely one. Hours upon hours, minutes upon minutes, seconds upon milliseconds, forming and soldering and turning, tempering and bleaching and buckle making, springing and timing and finishing and, well, the list goes on and on and on. Everything created to a standard that Kronos himself would be pleased with. These two men chose to dedicate almost every waking second to perfecting this ancient art. Indeed, even in slumber, they would surely dream of shaving that last slip of time loss from their latest mechanism, creating the ultimate time machine. This is a skill set that devours the sunlight for those who choose to master it. It is an art that is, ironically, timeless, but one that would have faded into the annals of history had George not taken it upon himself to rewind the clock once more. And had the fiery, determined young Roger not taken the bait of the challenge laid out before him to snatch the baton, waved at him, and run with it, they shared an unshakable obsession and an immovable focus. And yet, like any great pocket watch, these two characters have more layers and levels to their complication than you might at first think. What else was I amusing myself with? Motor cars, I love motor cars. <laughs> He did say that when he was a watchmaker, a man learning the trade, repairing watches, he had few friends. As soon as he bought a vintage Bentley, he had a hundred friends. I took up cars before I took up watchmaking. I think it was 1956. I took my first car to pieces and never stopped doing it since. Oh, rebuild cars. He was skilled at the workbench making watches, but he's just as skilled repairing benches. And I don't collect cars uh, for the collecting sake. Like the watches, they've got to make a fundamental difference. He was dedicated in everything he did, whether it was cars, motorbikes, watches, clocks, or writing. George would buy a car, which you and I would accept as being perfect, but would rebuild it. He didn't want any uh, hiccups along the way. He wanted to have a perfect car. I collect only historic racing cars, which I race. I've got 13 of them here, and I've raced all of them. And I got the pictures to prove it. A lot of fun it is to take your own car to a circuit and race it. Especially if there's some top drivers in the same race who uh, make you wish you were a bit cleverer. He didn't win a lot of races, but every race he took part in, they were fun. He would nearly always um, end up sideways on the grass, spinning. Fear was something that George Daniels actually didn't recognise. It was very hard keeping up with George in this car if, if you had something uh, not quite as fast. He was gone like the wind, you know. And we had some very good outings together uh, and some hair-raising experiences. I think the, the nearest I've ever come to death, I think, is <laughs> being driven in the Atala by George Daniels. Well, I'll show you the cars if you would like to see them. But there's a wonderful spirit uh, obtains uh, in motor racing. Everybody knows everyone, everybody's friendly. I found in one corner of my 
done it with a pile of photographs. And uh, I didn't remember them. I flicked through them. And I found that they were all uh, awards for various competitions and so forth. And uh, you see, amateur racing is such a casual, friendly affair that I never remembered I'd ever taken these pictures. Nor did I realize that I'd also won all these trophies. But yeah, yeah, enjoying the thing, you don't look for profit, you just get the fun out of it. But that was George, and he just didn't go out there to win. He, he went out there for the camaraderie, the fun. It's a privilege to drive these wonderful machines. The watchmaker openly professed that he did not have the necessary patience required to give personal instruction. He claimed it was because he worked too quickly. He did not want the burden of an apprentice. Disparaging about what he saw as the pervading philosophy of a nine-to-five culture, George always believed that success required great application and total disregard of the passing hours. And yet, somewhere not too far away, one determined young man, evidently cut from a similar cloth, refused to take no for an answer. Well, the second watch that I made was the, um, is a Torbjörn pocket watch, and it had a perpetual calendar on it. And it was that watch that I was making and remaking over a five year, five, five and a half year period. And basically at the end of the first year, I found that the components that I'd just recently made were of a far poorer quality, so I'd go back to the beginning of the watch and remake it. Eventually, well, I think my parents were running out of patience with me because I was still living and working at home. And I think I had also got to a stage where I just knew I couldn't physically improve on what I was making. You know, the quality of the parts I was very happy with now. And so it came to the time when I had to contact George and arrange another visit to the Isle of Man to show him the watch. And I think in my mind I'd sort of thought that if this didn't work, if this watch wasn't right, then really watchmaking for me was sort of finished, basically. I, I knew I couldn't really physically improve on that. So a lot hung on this particular meeting. I arrived at the allotted time at the house and he invited me in into his kitchen where he does all his paperwork, this big desk where all the papers spread out. And he just told me to stand and wait by the door there. Anyway, he continued doing his paperwork, shoveling bits of paper around and didn't say anything to me. And that continued for about five or 10 minutes. Eventually he said, right, he said, let's look at this watch. So he said, follow me. So we left the house and walked down to the workshop. And on the way, he said, uh, he said, your first watch was terrible, wasn't it? He said, I think you knew it was terrible. I don't know what you were doing trying to show it to me. What were you trying to prove? So, <laughs> I mean, what, how do you reply to that? I thought, this isn't good. But anyway, we got into the workshop. I followed him here. And George sat down at the bench there and I basically just stood sort of to, to his left and put the uh, watch down there where that pen is and he opened the box. He wasn't very impressed with the box. He isn't impressed with boxes. Took out the pocket watch and he just held it in his hand and then he put his glasses on and his magnifying glass and he just turned it over in his hand and looked at it and, and then he said, who made the pocket watch case for you? So I said, I did. Then he turned it around and looked at the dial and he said, where did you get the dial made? So I said, well, I made the dial. And turned it around a bit more and then he opened the back of the watch. At this point, my heart was just pumping 10 to the dozen, you know. I mean, this was the moment really. 
And then he looked at the mechanism and he said, uh, he said, who made the uh, Torbian carriage for you? So I said, I did. Then he looked at the escape wheel and he said, it's a very nice escape wheel. Where did you get that from? So I said, I, I made it, George. And anyway, with that, he just snapped the back to, put the watch down, stood up, and he says, congratulations, you're a watchmaker. I didn't listen to anything he said for the next 15, 20 minutes as he just paraded around the workshop talking, really animated. And I never have seen this man like that. You know, and he's just talking about watches and horology and his work and my possible future. And my mind was just completely whirling away. You know, here was the end of sort of seven, seven and a half years sort of quest to prove to this man that I could make a watch. That was, that was something special. And so it seemed the solitary watchmaker was finally relenting. He gained a worthy apprentice to join him on his journey, with whom he could share his ancient wisdom, the secret of time. In the middle of the Irish Sea, the Isle of Man stands at the very centre of the British Isles. It is independent in attitude as much as by constitution and has been quietly radical for over a thousand years. The past breathes through the hills and the shores and the soil. Upon the sails of their dragon ships, the North settlers brought with them the Triskelion symbol, which is to this day embroidered on the island's flags as the three legs of man, that denotes a turning sun as apt a metaphor as any watchmaker could wish for. It is a symbol which is engraved on each of Roger's watches. Perhaps it was the sum of all its parts and paradoxes that made the Isle of Man the perfect home. Or perhaps George Daniels, master watchmaker and keeper of time was simply seduced by the islander's most loved phrase, tre de lua, meaning time enough. In 1999, George started the Millennium Project and asked Roger to come to the island and assist. I think we were in France at the time and he rang up and said George had been on the phone, George Daniels, offered him a job. And he said, I've accepted. I said, it's great. Well, he really was. It was because I didn't think that would ever happen. Obviously, due to his age, he needed the help, but also he wanted to pass on the experiences, you know, and um, the skills which, you know, he developed over the years. There was no question of whether or not I liked it. I had an alternative, but to do it, if I was going to achieve, that, and of course, persuade all the other young watchmakers to follow me and not try and pass me, but I wouldn't like that. George had invented this escapement which Amiga had taken on board, and he wanted to create a series of watches around this, um, this new invention of his. And so I came over to the Alman and started work on um, assisting George. There we are. Come back to the escapement. It says by Omega. Well, they would say that, wouldn't they? He learned quickly to be skilled, and uh, so it saved a lot of time. He was also a bit stubborn now and again, but uh, a rap over the knuckles, you know. 
you know, that sort of thing. He saw in Roger obsession, gambler, and rebel. And that is what he saw in himself as well. So seeing that in Roger was very, very, very comforting for George, knowing there was another generation after him. It's like that scene in Star Wars, you know, where Yoda says, no, it's all right, there will be another, when Luke Skywalker goes off. George looked at Roger and said, my God, there's another generation. Isn't that wonderful? Obviously, there was a huge age gap. He was 72 and I was 28 when I arrived here. So um, our lives were very, very different. There's also banter. He always used to refer to me when things weren't going well as Smith of Bolton. And um, obviously, he referred to himself as Daniels of London. And that sort of says it all, really, doesn't it? George, I was wondering if you could have a look at this, please. Um, having a few difficulties with the click. And the first nine months were incredibly intense. I mean, really just full on. Um, at the time he was 72, I think. So he was still putting in full days. He expected me to put even longer hours. And um, he basically took me around the workshop, showing me every single bit of equipment and just teaching me how to use it to the standard that he required. The normal working day didn't apply to George. He got up at 6 o'clock in the morning, went into his workshop and came out at 10, 11 o'clock at night, a few hours sleep back in the workshop. And Roger worked for George for five or so years in the workshop sitting next door to him, um, learning all the time um, and under the watchful eye of George. Roger will tell you about the time he had making dials and how George used to reject them and say, no, go away, it's not good. And to most people's eyes, they were perfect. So you know, I have to do that bit of game, otherwise it works very well on me. So where do you want the points of engagement? To move it further on to this, this uh, the bulge. I kept beating Roger until he caught up with the speed I wanted. And finally, he resolved to follow. It was a great experience, probably you know, the finest finishing school you could wish for, working with the great man himself. Turning the dial, we're now ready to bleach it white, ready for finishing with the chapter rings. You see, it slowly begins to lose its shine. Right. We actually want to get this almost red hot. Watchmaking is a trade, a craft, an art, a profession, it's all those things. That has always passed from an individual, a master watchmaker, to apprentices. It's always been done that way. 200 years ago, apprentices didn't just learn how to make watches from master watchmakers. They would learn about finance, how to manage their own workshop. They would learn how to dress. They would learn the social mores of their time. The watchmaker might even find his apprentice a wife. Now, all that has disappeared, and the only thing we're left with is pure education. The master watchmaker teaching the apprentice how to go about making a watch. That's been replaced by watch schools. But it existed in the relationship between George and Roger Smith. And it's very, very important that it did. This is George's bench, and really, in my view, it's probably one of the most iconic benches in the world. I mean, every single uh, watch that George made was made at this bench. This bench was down in London. It moved over here to the Isle of Man. The Coaxial Escapement was built on this bench and many other of his 
sorts of incredible pieces. So all the hand tools all around the back, plenty of files for all the components and so on. And of course his infamous glasses and eyeglass. What George wanted out of me was to be able to make his watches to the standards he required. So it's serious work and I obviously wanted to and you know wanted to make the very best I could and if I could be accepted by George then really you know you, I, I hoped that my future would be a little bit easier. So for me when I was here in the workshop I kept fairly quiet and I just soaked everything up and I was like a big sponge really and if I wasn't working I mean we used to often go out to the pub for lunch and I'm afraid I just barraged him with questions about his whole life. I wanted to get as much out of the whole experience as he probably did from me. So it was a good two-way sort of relationship. George proved it could be done. He proved that in this age when we have all of these big brands with all this money behind him, you can still be an independent watchmaker. Our entire lives are structured around time. We take it for granted, minute after minute, hour after hour, year after year. What type of man dedicates his life to taking this human concept and creating its physical reality, and then elevating watchmaking beyond this into an art form? George was um, all about perfection and, and, the, and the best quality. And I say, Roger's the same. You can see it in Roger's work now, definitely. He was always incredibly demanding. He was always aware of the fact that he was the best and he expected the best from everyone else. That was my object and the reality was to improve it. Every aspect of it. So that the watch was a better thing after I'd finished and it was when I started. Mm. Didn't always quite work out. But then it's a very imperfect world, isn't it? You can't have everything. I'm afraid there's always this obsessive streak that I have that just says, when, the next, when I finish the next watch, that little component will be better. Or there's a little mark there. I don't think anybody else would ever notice it, but I notice it. And it, it's sort of put in the memory bank and you know, so the next piece is, you're always trying for perfection. I don't think with this job, you're, always, <laughs> you're ever totally happy. And there's something we have to bear in mind about Roger. He's 42 years old today. It's 2002, I think it's 42 or maybe 43. How old was George when he sat down and made his first watch? 42. You know, Roger's been making watches for 20 years. What's gonna happen over the next 20 years? What is Roger going to do? He knew what he wanted, and he was determined to do it. And um, that's, of course, a great incentive to do good original work. So Roger's got a long way to go, but I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. And it is not going to be a slavish imitation of George. It hasn't been so far. I'm sure it won't be in the future. I'm certainly similar in some areas, but not all. I mean, George was <laughs> quite an extraordinary man. Very big shoes to fill. To do what these individuals do, whether it's Roger or George or other independents, it requires a huge amount of dedication and perseverance and a certain personality because one is on one's own for a large amount of time. What I was learning about the college, I used to stand behind George and just watch. Don't enter into conversation. Um, ask questions afterwards, because you could just see the, the dedication of one man. And Roger works in the workshop with other people. Most of the watchmakers do, but George has only ever worked in the workshop by himself or with Roger. For me, the ultimate came when one day he took me out for lunch to the pub and he asked if I would assist him in making this anniversary wristwatch. And that for me was a turning point, knowing that he could trust me to make a watch for him. And that's, yeah, 
been wonderful. Sometimes tell them to be careful as they go through life, not to go too quickly. Just wait a little bit now and again. And remember, above all, if you saw a valuable artistic object and you didn't touch it, then you lost an opportunity because you only get one chance. And I wormed my way into many a big house to see their clocks and watches. I mean, the last 20 odd years, I've, all I've thought about is trying to create what we're now doing. It's been a, a total obsession. And um, it's been at the sort of consequence of everything else in my life, really. Go on, let's go. I don't think you're ever really satisfied with what you've achieved. You know, it's, it's always a continual quest. I mean, now, you know, we're in, increasing the size of my workshop and taking on new watchmakers, and it's always the next challenge, really. And um, I think that's what makes it exciting. As one gets older, one is very aware that one has to live every day. And one of my mottos in life is carpe diem, seize the moment. I think it's very important to seize the moment of time and not let that time be wasted. And uh, I think, you know, it sounds, it sounds a bit cheesy, but I think time is too precious to be wasted on a cheap wristwatch. You go and buy a watch for, I don't know, a couple of quid. But George's, George's watches were actually works of art. The, uh, to look at them, to gaze into George's watches is like gazing into his very soul. They were, they were, every single part was George. They were so beautiful. A lot of things today in the society that we live in are very disposable. And you, know, you buy it, it stops working, you throw it away. These watches are built in such a way that hopefully they will last forever, even when Roger and George are long gone. They can be serviced by any good watchmaker. Uh, my children or my children's children can take them along, and so they'll, they'll stand the passage of time. I think that's, that's important. Stars, and time by the sun, and time by the moon. I want you to see my Eduardo Palos. Here's a better one. This is my Eduardo. We used to meet in cafes in London, especially the, the Artists Club. And I used to play the mouse woman, and Eduardo would bang his fork on the table. My fundamental interest in it, which I pursued avidly throughout the whole, and I've done 65 years at the watchmaker's bench. And during that 65 years, I always did what I knew was required in horology, never mind what other people thought. If I thought it was necessary, then we have to go and do it. And uh, it worked out all right in the end, I think. I discovered that by accident. First thing that I'd like to do. And this clock I'm very fond of. It's, uh... I don't think his life was smooth. He actually drove himself. You know, there was a, there was stress in his life at times, but he 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 got over it. He was he was a very strong man. Don't forget that. He probably nearly died four or five times from every disease known to man, but he got over them because he had this courage and this strength of purpose to fight on with everything. Well, it's all been most enjoyable. Now, where was I going? Down, down there. It's a sheer egocentricity. That's the way it gets done. You can't hesitate. You've got to go straight in, firmly, confidently, and hope it turns out all right. So it's been a very happy life for me. Words could make wishes come true. The anniversary piece was um, started discussing it with George about three years ago, and um, 
the intention was that should he have should he die, then we would carry on with that project. And um, fortunately, he saw the piece several weeks before he passed away. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. I mean, one thing that George did, what was the extraordinary things that he did was he was the first person in history to have ever made a watch from start to finish. You don't really, you don't get that today in the industry. Certainly learning how to make pocket watches by hand using George's methods, I've learned that also. If I can pass that on to other people through the, the apprentices that we now have working, with me, you know, that would be great. If here on the Isle of Man we can start a small community of watchmakers, you know, producing very small quantities of watches, but to an extraordinary high level, a level that you just can't get in mass production. If by the <laughs> time I die, I can achieve that, then that would be great. Every watchmaker knows that he is perfecting the measurement of his own mortality. The turning hands on a watch are symbols for the revolutions that spin out man's span. The hands turn, the sun rises, apogee sets, moons change, days renew. It is man that ends, but his works can endure. And perhaps the nicest thing is that in George's will, he's left the total contents of his workshop, a lifetime's collection of equipment. Everything in the workshop is left to Roger. And I spoke to George before his death about his wishes, and it was absolutely clear in his own mind that Roger was the future. I was George's apprentice. He's the only one who can say that. Nobody else can ever say it, so no. Watch this space, you'll see him rise to the levels of George. I suppose for George to have said, you're good enough to do that, that's... <laughs> I'm very pleased with Roger. You work very hard with the application that you don't see very often. So he deserves all this success. I suppose he thinks one day he might be as good as me. Who knows? <laughs> and publish that.